to say what a great pleasure it is to be here this evening, and thank you, Cherie, for uh, arranging this. Uh, the Niagara Foundation has just simply been wonderful, and uh, they've supported our work, uh, and to have them um, uh, support uh, the whole idea behind the work, which is to bring powerful new research to help change public understanding about the problems we face, especially the security problems we face, is just critically important to what we're doing. And I really appreciate how much uh, uh, you have done to do this. Um, it's very important that we move beyond the war on terror. As you're going to see, the war on terror has clearly been, been producing more terrorists than it has been stopping. Uh, this is the second round of debate about the war on terror. Five years ago, we had a debate on the war on terror. It was mostly centered on Iraq. And you'll notice that, in fact, in the last five years, what have we done? We have withdrawn a large number of forces from Iraq. And what's happened in that period of time? As we've withdrawn those forces, things have gotten better, better in Iraq. I'll be telling you more about that. Today, we're now in a position where we were in Iraq five years ago in Afghanistan. We're having a very similar debate, a different administration, very different politically, but as you'll see, we're having very similar problems. Also, I believe the solution is the same, which is public education about the real facts of what's driving the threat that we face, because that is how we changed matters fundamentally in Iraq, and how I believe we could change matters in Afghanistan, and in general, move beyond the war on terror. As many of you uh, know, because you've come up and said hi, <laughs> I spend a good deal of my time studying suicide terrorism. Suicide terrorism is the lung cancer of terrorism. Suicide terrorist attacks kill by far the most people, on average 12 times as many as the average terrorist attack. The element of suicide is what made it possible for the 19 hijackers to kill 3,000 people on 9-11. So what that means is the threat we face is not just terrorism, but it's specifically suicide terrorism. And also, also like lung cancer, you're going to see that suicide terrorism has specific risk factors associated with the phenomenon. And I treat suicide terrorism a lot the way, uh, the same way a medical researcher might treat lung cancer. I, with a research team, collect information about all the suicide attacks that have occurred around the world since the early 1980s when the modern phenomenon began. And by doing that, that reveals tremendously important information about what does and does not trigger suicide terrorism. That is the threat that we actually face. Now, what we're going to do today is talk about the global patterns of suicide terrorism over time. But before we do that, I want to just pause for a moment and answer a question that a number of you will have along the way, which is, how good is the data? Because as you're going to see, the arguments I'm going to make here aren't coming from a political perspective. They're not coming from an ideology. They're coming from the data up. And as we go forward, you will want to know, how good is the data? So let me just first start with this. Um, if we could have the next slide, please. Um, and you'll see, by the way, that a few months ago, when the book first came out, Cut and Fuse first came out, we had this large conference on Capitol Hill. <laughs> and so our website is still very proud of that, and the research team is still very proud of that. Um, and so if you go to our website, the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism, uh, you'll see a lot of information about the work we do and, and, and so forth. Uh, but what I want to call attention to specifically is the database. And this database is online. Um, and so it's, uh, and it's free. It's something you'll be able to, uh, uh, well, you see, my research began actually uh, a number of years ago when in 2003 I published the first complete database of all suicide attacks around the world. Uh, I knew when I published that database as part of an academic article that no academic or think tank had done that. I was surprised when our own Department of Defense contacted me and told me no government 
had that database either. You see, our government, like many governments around the world, didn't begin to collect global statistics on suicide terrorism until after 9-11. And because our database went back to 1980, when the modern phenomenon really begins, uh, they were very interested in funding the database, even though, as you'll see, it's, that was under the Donald Rumsfeld Defense Department. It's really quite interesting that they funded so much of the early work here, um, and the, uh, especially given the findings. Um, and the um, allowing me to expand the work um, to, uh, into a center, into the center of the Chicago Project on Security and Terrorism. And if we could have the next slide, please. Uh, if you go to our people page, you'll see that we have a large number of people working for us. But the most important part I want to show you are the native language speakers. You see, we collect information about suicide terrorism all around the world, not just in English, but in all the key native languages associated with the phenomenon. Arabic, Hebrew, Tamil, Russian, Urdu. We could probably do any language at this point. And as you'll see, this is very, very helpful in helping us to really cover the waterfront on information about suicide terrorist attacks, not just where they happen, but who does them. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about this data, again, as a database, and just to sort of show you, um, again, answer the question, how good is the database? Let's kind of play with this uh, kind of version online just for a second. If you go to our database, you can just find, you'll be able to search it pretty quickly, and you can easily see that we have uh, the key factors you'd be interested in, but let me pick Lebanon as an example. Uh, you can go to country, you can click Lebanon, and you'll all know Hezbollah, of course. Um, and if we go further and say, well, how many suicide attacks have there been in Lebanon since 1980? Next slide, please. You'll see in the summary statistics there have been 38. And as we develop this, you're actually going to want to know, again, how good is that 38? And you'll see right here that right off the bat, we don't just have summary statistics, but you have information where you can go to each attack and view details. Let's go there. The, and we'll pick just the first attack. And you'll see that actually quite a bit of information about each attack. And this will turn out to be important because we now have over 2,200 suicide terrorist attacks. So this level of detail on every single one, including very often, not just date number killed, but the names of the suicide attackers, socioeconomic information about the suicide attackers, very, very helpful. Um, but again, how good is the database? Well, if you go to the bottom, you'll see sources, sources that start to look like footnotes. But as we get drilled down deeper, you're really going to want to have some confidence in this database. And this is what's been very important vis-a-vis -vis certain parts of Washington. And the next slide, please, where I just picked a source just to show you that we put online for free all the hard source verification of the data that I'm showing you. Each and every bit of information I'm showing here, you here today has been corroborated by a minimum of two independent sources of information, no anonymous internet chat room data, hard information, and we're not just asserting it, we put those documents on the line, and we typically have four or five or six of these for each of the attacks, so we have over 10,000 documents online verifying all this information that you're seeing. This is really quite a wealth of information. This is information we're putting out for free. And so you can see that this is very, very helpful to do from a university because uh, this is something that a university can really bring to the country. And that's why the University of Chicago has been so critical in making all this happen. Um, but now, what is what does the data actually show? So let me show you the global patterns in two parts. First, from 1980 to 2003. Uh, then, think about that as the world of suicide terrorism before the Iraq War. And then from 2004 on, the world after the Iraq War. Well, if we look at suicide terrorism from 1980 to 2003, there were 343 completed suicide terrorist attacks defined in the classic sense you'd expect of an individual killing himself, himself, or herself, herself on a mission to kill others. The world leader during this period is not an Islamic group. They're the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka, a Marxist group, a secular group, a Hindu group. The Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka have done more suicide attacks than Hamas. Now, just think about that for a moment. What do most people think is driving suicide terrorism? Islamic fundamentalism. That, that's certainly out of whack. Further, a third of all uh, Muslim groups 
who do suicide attack are purely secular, such as the PKK in Turkey, which is another Marxist, read, anti-religious suicide terrorist group. Uh, this group, the Niagara folks, probably know for a bit about uh, the PKK more than most of the groups I speak to. Uh, but the point is, the point is that well over half of the suicide attacks during this period were not associated with Islamic fundamentalism. This is critical. This is critical because you'll see treating these, uh, this phenomenon as if it's driven by religion when it's not can make the problem worse. <coughs> Next slide, please. What over 95% of all suicide attacks around the world since 1980 have in common is not religion, but a specific secular and strategic goal to compel a democratic state to withdraw combat forces. I don't mean advisors with sidearms, I mean tanks, fighter aircraft, and armor units from territory the terrorists consider to be their homeland or prize greatly from Lebanon, Chechnya, the West Bank then, and you'll see to Iraq and Afghanistan today, this strategic logic is the core logic driving suicide terrorism, the core threat that we face, the reason we turned our country upside down after 9-11. Doesn't quite account for every attack, does over 95%. Next slide, please. This slide shows you the nine disputes from 1980 to 2003 that produced the 95% of those suicide terrorist attacks I just told you about. If you let your eye go up and down the middle column, you'll see that territory is centrally important to each and every one of these suicide terrorist campaigns. Now, let me pick uh, one, uh, Lebanon, as an example, uh, again, you'll all know Hezbollah. In June 82, Hezbollah did not exist. In June 1982, Israel invaded southern Lebanon with 78,000 combat soldiers, 3,000 tanks and armor vehicles. One month later, Hezbollah was born. Then, over the course of the next year, uh, and for reasons we're still not quite sure about, uh, Hezbollah began to experiment with suicide attack. And the fourth suicide attack was the famous suicide truck bombing of the U.S. Marines in Beirut uh, in October 83, killing 241 of our troops. The same day, they hit the French with a suicide attack, killing 58 French soldiers. Well, a few months later, Ronald Reagan, no pacifist, decided to withdraw all American combat forces from the country rather than face another suicide attack. That was cutting and running. <laughs> That's what it really meant. Uh, the uh, French left when we did. And then in 1986, the Israelis withdrew uh, first by 86 to the Six Mile Security Zone in southern Lebanon. And then in May 2000, the Israeli army left Lebanon altogether. And what's important about those withdrawals is that Hezbollah suicide attackers did not follow the Americans to New York, or the French to Paris, or even the Israelis to Tel Aviv. Since May 2000, when the Israeli army left, do you know how many suicide attacks there have been by Hezbollah, or just Lebanon period? Zero. Not even during the summer of 2006, when you'll remember a three-week air war between Israel and Hezbollah. Now think about that for a moment. If suicide attacks are just about a bunch of religious fanatics looking for a quick trip to heaven on any old excuse whatsoever, surely we should have seen hundreds of Hezbollah suicide attacks in the summer of 2006, and we didn't see any whatsoever. Very, very important evidence about what's driving suicide terrorism and the tight relationship that the trigger, what's triggering suicide terrorism is foreign occupation. Uh, lung cancer. People who get lung cancer, 85% of the time, they have smoked. 85% of the time. People or areas that get suicide terrorism, 95% of the time, they're under foreign occupation. Think about it for a moment. It's a stronger relationship than the relationship between smoking and lung cancer. Uh, next slide, please. We talk about uh, Al-Qaeda. 
This research was the first to collect the complete set of the 71 individuals from 1995 to 2004 who actually killed themselves to carry out attacks for Osama. Of those 71, we know the names, nationalities, and other socioeconomic data of 67. Not quite all, but almost all. And if you look, you'll see the largest number, 34, come from Saudi Arabia, the majority from the Arabian Peninsula, where the United States first began to station combat forces in 1990. It's important to underscore, even to a, a, a you know, well-informed audience, that 1990 was a watershed year in our military deployment to the Arabian Peninsula. Yes, before 1990, we had some advisors, a few hundred of them actually, with sidearms, mostly Marines, standing in front of embassies. But no tanks, no fighter aircraft, no armor units going all the way back to World War II. We put them in, in 1990, to kick Saddam out of Kuwait. We kicked Saddam out of Kuwait in March 91 and never left. From that point on, we kept between 10 and 30,000 heavy combat forces stationed on the Arabian something we had not done since World War II. The Al Qaeda suicide attack five years later, 1995. Notice where the Al Qaeda attackers were not coming from Iran, surely an Islamic fundamentalist population, three times the population of Saudi Arabia. No Al Qaeda suicide attackers. Sudan. Sudan is an Islamic fundamentalist country, same population size as Saudi Arabia, and with a brand of Islamic fundamentalism so congenial to Osama, he chose to live there for three years in the 1990s. No Al-Qaeda suicide attackers. I could go through the largest Islamic fundamentalist populations on the planet, and you would see this was being driven by Islamic fundamentalism. You'd get a different pattern than what you see here. But rather than just statistics, let me again come back to the 9-11 hijackers and the most notorious Al Qaeda suicide attackers, those from London in 2005. Let, let them tell you with their own voices. Let me show you six of the most notorious martyr, uh, suicide attackers for Al Qaeda and their martyr videos. You just wait one second before you open it up, or if you could just pause it when it opens up. Uh, I'm going to show you six uh, and two from London, 2005. They're going to speak to you in English. Four of the 9-11 hijackers. They're going to speak to you in Arabic, and you'll see subtitles so that you can follow. We're also going to bookend the, uh, the British, the, the suicide attackers from London. So again, it makes it easier for you to follow. And let's let them tell you for themselves. <coughs> This is how our ethical stances are dictated. Um, your de democratically elected governments continuously perpetuate atrocities against my people all over the world. And your support them makes you directly responsible, just as I am directly responsible for protecting and avenging my Muslim brothers and sisters. Until we feel security, you will be our targets. And until you stop the bombing, gassing, imprisonment and torture, of my people, we will not stop this fight. We are at war and I am a soldier. I'm 
الله تعالى مع دعوات اليوم في بلاد المسلمين احتلالا ضاعفا لا غبار عليه وانتم ايها العلماء تقولون هذا وتقرونه حتى لبلاد العظيم كيف لا ونحن قد هنا في بيت ربنا ونفسنا ومنا وقلتنا ومقدساتنا واحتل ما نوصل لليهود والنصارى وهي اعظم مصيبه بعد مصيبه وفاه الرسول صلى الله عليه وسلم ومما يزيدها عظما ان هذا الاحتلال تم بالتعاون مع الحكام المستبدين فجزيره العرب منذ ان خلق الله صحراءها وحفها ببحارها لم يدهمها مثل هذا البلاء قط فانا لله وانا اليه راجعون وما بلاد الحرمين فيه من اختلال وتردي ومخطط من اليهود والنصارى وعلى راسهم امريكا دمرها الله التي ما نزل بالاسلام والمسلمين من مصيبه الا كانت سببا فيها. وجه هذه الاسماء الظريفه التي اغسلها وتحقق ان شاء الله ونتنفق على التسليم ونتنفق بالقران والسنه في افغانستان والعراق. The so-called financial and military support to the U.S. and Israel and the children of these poor Muslim prisoners from Belmarsh and the forces of the Kennedy. I know that you feel that the time is I know that the war will never stop. And that we are ready to give our lives 100 times over for the cause of Islam. You will never experience peace until our children in Palestine our mothers and sisters in Kashmir, our brothers in Afghanistan and Iraq feel peace. So what you're saying is powerful evidence that foreign occupation is the trigger that triggers both secular and religious suicide attackers. I'm not telling you religion plays no role. Uh, I'm not trying to tell you that this would account for all of terrorism. Again, it's like smoking and lung cancer. Lung cancer is the most virulent form of cancer. Yes, there are other cancers, some of them way, uh, just as there are other forms of terrorism, some of them quite benign. What we care about with cancer more than anything else is lung cancer, not just because it's the most deadly, but also because it has specific risk factors associated with it we can do something about. It. The same with suicide terrorism. This is the centerpiece of the threat that we face, and it's driven by a specific risk factor one occupation over 95% of the time. If this is right, then what should we expect if we see more occupation, more suicide terrorism? Now let's look at the world since 2004. Oh, oh wait, I think we missed one. There we are. <laughs> um, uh, let's look at the world of suicide terrorism since 2004. Since 2004, there have been over 1,800 suicide attacks. Remember, there were 300 from 1980 to 2003. And those 1,800 suicide attacks are not thinly scattered around the world in marginal or uh, radical extreme populations. They are concentrated. They are highly concentrated in the areas of foreign occupation. This is tremendously important. For this pattern, with now over 2,200 suicide attacks uh, around the world since 1980, for this pattern to be wrong, that is the association with foreign occupation, we would have had to have missed not just five suicide attacks around the world, or even 50 there would literally have to be hundreds of suicide attacks occurring somewhere around the world, not in areas at the bottom of this chart. I don't mean that we would have had to overcount or undercount Iraq or Afghanistan. I mean they'd have to be occurring in Mozambique. They'd have to be occurring in Bangladesh. And not just one, I mean hundreds for this pattern not to occur. Now, even with this large research team, I can't literally swear to you that we have every single attack that's occurred around the world, although I have to tell you, given how much we pour into this, I don't think we've missed even five. I would be shocked if we've missed even that many, um, because keep in mind, a lot of people would like to look at this, so we've spent a lot of time with this. Uh, um, but I'm sure we haven't missed hundreds. 
you would know if there's hundreds not, again, occurring somewhere, South Africa, Brazil, Mozambique, in an area of the world we're not counting. This is powerful confirmation for the logic that foreign occupation is the key trigger to suicide terrorism. Moreover, notice how many are anti-American. In the year 2000, the year 2000, the year before 9-11, there were just 20 suicide attacks around the world. One against the U.S. coal, anti-American. Last year, 300 suicide attacks around the world. Over 270 anti-American. That is against us or people working for us and with us, our allies. That pattern is not a healthy pattern for Americans. That is, it's quite clear that the more we've waged the war on terror, and specifically the more we've waged the war on terror, according to the false precept, it's driven by religion, Islamic fundamentalism, the more we've produced more terrorists than we've killed. This is simply not safe. We are not making ourselves safer. Now let me go into a few conflicts here and kind of unpack for you what's happened. Uh, can we have the next one, please, sir? Uh, Iraq. Uh, Iraq's a prime example of the logic uh, that I'm laying out for you. Before our invasion in March 2003, Iraq never experienced a suicide attack in its history. Since then, you can see it goes up until two, in 2007 is the peak, and then it comes down. And it comes down in this distinctly two-step pattern. And it's down a little bit more in the last year, but this two-step pattern. Why did it come down? And why did it come down specifically from 07 to 08, step one? and then 08 to 09, and actually continue on to today, step two. Why this two-step pattern? Very important. Well, most people would instinct, and let me just tell you, first of all, a couple of facts here before I give you the full explanation. It's important to recognize that during this period of time, there wasn't just one conflict occurring in Iraq, but two. A three-sided civil war uh, among Shia, Kurds, and Sunnis, all three trying to kill each other, with ordinary violence and one-sided, Sunni-only suicide terrorism. During this period, we don't have a single Shia suicide attacker or Kurdish suicide attacker. Now also think about that for a moment. We have plenty of Shia Islamic fundamentalists here in Iraq. Uh, Sadr, the Sadr Brigade, 20,000 strong, no suicide attacks. Why is that? It's because, remember, Saddam wasn't just a tyrant, he was a Sunni. When we toppled Saddam, we toppled the Sunnis, and who then would replace that Sunni government? Well, either an American government or a Shia-dominated government. But in either case, who's the most out? The Sunnis are the most oppressed by that occupation. They're the ones who are most in trouble, and that's why the Sunnis are doing suicide terrorism. But why? Does it come down? And again, come down in this distinctly two-step pattern. Well, from 07 to 08, many people might instinctively also say, well, it's the surge. We put in more troops, and that must have been the answer. Well, let's look at that and see if that's really what happened. The next slide, please. Uh, what changed in Anbar province and the country as a whole during this period of time? Anbar is the Sunni triangle, the area where the Sunnis live. And by the way, I'm using the Pentagon's own numbers here. So these are not kind of coming out of <laughs> thin air. Uh, and let's compare September 06 to September 08. Total number of troops, US and coalition troops in Iraq during the surge when we put in 21,000 troops, declines. How can that be? It's because our allies were leaving faster than we were putting troops into Iraq. For the country as a whole, during the surge, we were essentially backfilling for allies who were leaving. But then you might say, well, wait a second. Maybe even though we uh, didn't increase troops as a whole, we put them in Anbar. And by putting them in Anbar, we sat on top of the Sunni insurgency. That's the similar logic you're hearing with Afghanistan. Well, uh, we can look at that. We can say, where, uh, how did the troop numbers change in Anbar? 
And you can see, they do slightly tick up from 34K to 38K, but nowhere near the number 100,000 they would have to have been by General Petraeus's manual, that is, by the coin doctrine, as we, uh, uh, as, as Petraeus laid it out. Uh, and I'm pretty familiar with this because I was the reviewer for uh, the Petraeus manual being published by the University of Chicago Press. Uh, I was in favor of that. I supported that. I'm a big believer in all, you know, hundred, you know, everything blooming. Um, so I'm very <laughs> well, uh, very familiar with that. But so. We, it's not because we did counterinsurgency. It's not because we increased troops, uh, uh, that is Western troops, uh, in Anbar. The real change that occurred in Anbar is in the last column, the sons of Iraq. What we did is we paid 100,000 Sunni terrorists, or insurgents, whatever word you want to choose, $300 a month to do one thing, don't kill us. Now. We'd hope you take that $300 a month and go get a job, but it's okay if you want to go buy a gun with it. <laughs> if you want the next $300 paycheck next month, you know what you can't do? Don't kill us. <laughs> that is how we built the Sons of Iraq. By building the Sons of Iraq, notice right off the bat, you're giving the Sunnis the independent ability to secure themselves against two against the Shia-dominated government, yes, even against us, and also against the terrorists, all three simultaneously. They didn't become our employees. In fact, at the time, this was one of the big controversies. What do you mean you're going to give these terrorists $300 a month? Maybe they'll turn the guns on the Americans. No, it actually worked out pretty well according to the theory, the arguments you're seeing here, which is if it's really for an occupation that's really motivating and you provide security, the ability for them to secure themselves and protect their way of life into the future, then you should see that violence, the energy for the violence, die down. And that's exactly what we saw. Now, that occurred, uh, again, September 08. Then what happened in uh, the next year in 09? That's, uh, or the end of 08, that's when we signed, November 08 is when we signed the withdrawal agreements. Those withdrawal agreements we've now been implementing. We're actually ahead of schedule. Uh, and what has happened, as I said, in the last few years, as we've withdrawn, we haven't emboldened the terrorists. We haven't created a new caliphate on the Arabian Peninsula in Iraq. Uh, we, uh, what we've been doing is putting the terrorists out of business. <laughs> that has been cutting the fuse. And why does that work? It works because what's motivating terrorists, suicide terrorists, is the foreign occupation. Those suicide terrorists, nearly all of them, are walk-in volunteers, not longtime members of the organization. Most are joining just a few months or even just a few weeks specific, before their suicide attack specifically to do their suicide attack. And of course, once you've done one, you don't get to do another. So the key here really is demotivating or cutting the fuse to the recruits because it's the recruits who are actually the threat. Osama may be out there. He can say he can talk all he wants, but he needs the recruits. And those recruits, they come up out of the just out of the blue once the occupation comes and they go away almost on a dime when the occupation goes away. Notice how the groups don't change but the terrorism is. Why? Because there's the root no recruits. Uh, now, what happened in, uh, next slide please. What happened in Afghanistan? Afghanistan is a very similar case. It's again a prime example where before we uh, uh, top of the Taliban in fall 2001, no suicide attacks in Afghanistan's history. Then, interestingly, for the first few years, there's just a teeny tiny number of suicide attacks. Why is that? And then suddenly in 2006, it spikes up. And then it stays high. It stays high. What happened in 2006? Because it's exploding up and then staying high. Why? It's even high. It's basically flat in 2010. If we showed you numbers dead, you'd see it slightly higher. But it's basically flat in 09 and 010. Uh, next slide, please. Well, uh, first of all, who's being struck? The targets of the suicide attacks in Afghanistan overwhelmingly about 85% of the targets are against 
U.S. and Western troops. That's what the green is, U.S. and Western troops. So why is it suddenly in 2006 there is this large number of suicide attacks against U.S. and Western troops in, Iraq, in Afghanistan? <laughs> Next slide, please. Well, let's see who's doing the suicide attacks in Afghanistan. Uh, we can identify and corroborate the identity of 93 of the suicide attackers in Afghanistan. Uh, we think that's a fairly large number. Uh, last April, actually, I was, I was contacted by Army Intelligence in Kabul. They had 52. They asked if we had more, and so we did. Uh, we showed them our data. Their data is classified, so I don't get to see their data. Uh, but they told me the patterns were the same. So it's very uh, helpful to know. I think we, uh, by you know, really scouring, uh, we really have, I think, the best data. But notice how 90% of the suicide attackers are Afghanis, Afghan citizens. And they're not just any Afghan citizens, they're Pashtuns. 5% are from the immediately adjacent border regions, and only 5% are coming from outside the zone of conflict. This is not some global jihad swirling around the world looking for a place to strike. This is regional opposition to Western military presence. That's what's happening. But again, why 2006? What's causing Afghans to do suicide attacks against US and NATO troops in 2006 on, in big numbers? Next slide, please. Well, it has something to do with troops, but it's not a direct linear relationship. That's not quite what foreign occupation is, and I'll say more about that in just a moment. But let's look at the troop escalation that we've engaged in Afghanistan in recent years. Notice how Obama's surge is not really new. We've been surging over 20,000 troops every year in Afghanistan for the last four years. We've been putting big numbers of troops. Obama's surge is not new. We call it the surge. Obama's trying to make it new. It's not new. He's just pursuing the Bush strategy here. Uh, but notice how this has been a steady incremental escalation, a lot like Vietnam, by the way. Um, but the key thing you need to know is that during these early years, we not only had just a small number of troops in Afghanistan, but they were just in Kabul. For the first few years of our occupation, we were not spread around the country. We were occupying Kabul with those few thousand troops, mainly to protect Karzai from being assassinated. We were worried he would get assassinated. Um, and also because it wasn't until October 2003 that the UN gave us a mandate to spread our troops around the rest of the country. If we could see the next slide, please. This is the actual ISAF map for following that geographic exp uh, expansion of um, our troops around the country. ISAF is the name of the international force in Afghanistan. Uh, once the UN gave us the mandate, ISAF, has a good staff, like a good staff does, they came up with a plan. And they had a four-stage plan. Stage one, go to the north, our friends, the Northern Alliance. Stage two, go west, our more friends. <laughs> then it's in late 05, early 06. Where do we go? the south and the east, the Badlands, the Pashtun homeland. That's why it's 2006 when the Pashtuns are occupied and the Pashtuns are doing suicide terrorism and it basically explodes against the troops that are occupying them. And further, if I were to show you what's happening in Pakistan, you would see a very similar phenomenon with just a six month lag. First thing to know, those of you who know this region, the Pashtun homeland is divided by the border that doesn't really exist <laughs> between Afghanistan and Pakistan. The other half of the Pashtun homeland is in Pakistan, immediately on the other side of the border. And as we are directly occupying this half, of the Pashtun homeland. In the fall of 2006, we put pressure on Musharraf to take 100,000 Pakistani army troops that were stationed against Pakistan's main threat, which is 
India. The number one threat to Pakistan is India. Remember, they almost had a nuclear war in 2002. Okay, These 100,000 troops were stationed in the east to defend against the Indian incursion. We put pressure on Musharraf, basically broke both his arms, to take 100,000 Pakistani army troops, put them on the western provinces to do our bidding, to do our bidding, and what happened? Suicide terrorism in Pakistan exploded. That's where, and three quarters of all the suicide attacks in Pakistan are against the Pakistani army in the western provinces. Also, it caused Musharraf's legitimacy to plummet because he went from being our putative ally to our stooge. He went from being, and that simply is not going to work. <laughs> he lost his legitimacy by doing that. We actually watched that year as uh, he was losing his legitimacy, and what did we do? We decided to put Budo in as a backup. Budo had been begging us, she lived in London, she'd been begging the Bush administration to let her go back and support her. And as we saw Musharraf's legitimacy plummeting, uh, we said, Cheney suddenly decided, sure, let's let Budo go back, we'll support her. And in the fall of 2007, she went back. In October 2007, al-Zahari, uh, al-Qaeda's number two, sent her a note saying, uh, we know you're just a backup for Musharraf, we know you're an American stooge, get out or we're going to kill you. Well, she didn't get out and she suffered a suicide attack. Uh, so my basic point is that this isn't just causing suicide terrorism here, first of all, uh, uh, that's just localized, it's also causing Pakistan to come apart. And it's that combination of direct and indirect occupation. But is it actually affecting things here at home? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. The number one recruiting tool for Al Qaeda to recruit homegrown terrorists to kill us here is our presence overseas. You saw that a bit with the British attackers. Let me show you a key recruiting video by Al Qaeda. Can we go to the next slide? Uh, I want to show you, don't call it up just yet, sir. Um, I want to show you a video by Adam Gadon. Adam Gadon is an American citizen. He's about 33 years old. Adam Gadon was born in Riverside, California. Uh, he uh, is, his name is Adam. Uh, his father was Jewish. When the family was young, the family converted to Christianity. And then he was, a, when he was a teenager, he converted to Islam. And since 1998, He's been living with Osama either in Afghanistan or now, we believe, in the western parts of Pakistan. Well, in 2006, he came out with what's called his coming out video, uh, where his face was shown for the first time. This is the number one recruiting video by Al Qaeda to recruit homegrown terrorists to kill us. Yes, they've done more since, but this is by far the big one, the one that starts it. And let's let me show you Adam Gadon's pitch. And also, about two thirds of the way through, remember the Fort Hood shooting spree. So, sir, and then you might have to maximize it when it comes up. It's a movie. It's a movie, but you have to maximize the, you'll see, yeah, up at the corner, if you could. It's crucial for Muslims to keep in mind. Yeah, if you could just maximize it and then like, won't even restart it. There you are, yeah. It's crucial for Muslims to keep in mind that the Americans, the British, and the other members of the Coalition of Terror have intentionally targeted Muslim civilians and civilian targets, both before as well as after September 11th, uh, in both the first and second Iraq wars, as well as in their forays into Somalia uh, and the Sudan and Afghanistan, just to give you a few examples. And they've done this with the support and backing of their populations and electorates. I mean, even if there have been some feeble protests scattered here and there in the West, chiefly against the latest war in Iraq, all the same, the governments who started these wars have been re-elected by a majority of the popular vote. In the regression against Afghanistan, which for Westerners and uh, their mercenary sympathizers is the least controversial of Bush and Blair's terrorist wars, 
They have targeted civilians for assassination and kidnapping. They kidnapped any non-Afghans they found and shipped them off to Guantanamo or worse. Many were handed over to the American and British-backed despotic regimes of the Islamic world to be brutally interrogated and uh, with the blessing and support of that notorious Afghan killer, Hamid Karzai, they've murdered thousands of Afghan civilians as they slept in their beds, traveled on the roads, attended weddings, and prayed at the mosques. I know they've killed and maimed civilians in their stripes because I've seen it with my own eyes. My brothers have seen it. I've carried the victims in my arms. Women, children, toddlers, babies in their mother's wombs. You name it, they've probably bombed it. I could go on and on, and that's just stuff I understand. We haven't talked about American and British atrocities in the two Iraq wars. Uh, let's take a look at the latest to be revealed. In uh, Mahmoudia, five American soldiers gang rape an Iraqi woman, and then to hide the evidence, murder her and three members of her family and burn her body. And then when our Mujahideen take revenge on the unit which committed this outrage and capture and execute two of its members, they're called terrorists, and Muslims are supposed to uh, disown them or face the consequences. And I'm not saying that we should go and slaughter their women and children one by one like they did ours at Haditha and Ishaqi and Mahmoudia and, and God knows where else. Even if some of our legal experts have pointed that. And even if it's hard to imagine that any compassionate person could see pictures, just pictures, of what the, of what the Crusaders did to those children and not want to go on a shooting spree at the Marines housing facilities at Camp Pendleton. But I, what, what I am saying is that when we bomb their cities and civilians like they bomb ours, or destroy their infrastructure and means of transportation like they destroy ours, or kidnap their non-combatants like they kidnap ours, no sane Muslim should shed tears for them. And they should blame no one but themselves, because they're the ones who started this dirty war, and they're the ones who will end it, by ending their aggression against Islam and Muslims, by pulling out of our region, and by keeping their hands out of our affairs. And until and unless they do that, neither Forest Gate-style police raids, nor Belmarsh or Guantanamo prison cells, nor the mosques and imams' advisory council will be able to prevent the Muslims from exacting revenge on behalf of their persecuted brothers and sisters. So, no 72 virgins. Hardly any discussion of Islam as a religion. From beginning to end, this is an empathetic plea to respond to the plight of a kindred population facing atrocities from a foreign occupation. This is why the more we've gone over there, the more they want to come here. And unless we literally cut that fuse, we won't stop the threat. We won't end that underlying fear. So just remember a few months ago how quick we were to have this big fight over the mosque, the New York mosque. Why is that? It's because most Americans today think most Muslims want to kill them. It's that simple. It's that simple. Unless we directly talk about what's driving the terrorists and actually show the numbers, you're not going to change that. Because it's not about civil liberties. It's not about people should have equal rights. No, when you think somebody else wants to kill you, <laughs> OK, you're in a Habesian state of nature. <laughs> you're suddenly going to put all those other things aside, or at least the vast majority of folks really will. There's only one way to actually confront this, and that's with public education, that's with real information, real facts, and really talking about the issue. It took, it took decades to change minds about smoking and lung cancer. Today, we too quickly forget that when did we start to have hypotheses about smoking and lung cancer? the 1940s. When did the government, when did a president first declare war on cancer? It was actually Nixon, <laughs> 25 years later. We can do better than that. We have more grassroots organizations that can do better than that, but it's not going to happen unless we actually move the information. Now, what policies do I think we should pursue? And what I would do is I'd apply that strategy here to Afghanistan. 
Uh, the main argument held against this is, oh, we couldn't possibly move to this strategy over two or three years. Why? We'd embolden the terrorists. We'd have a new caliphate. Well, that's the same argument that we had in Iraq. And we put the terrorists, or nearly completely out of business, almost out of business, as we completely pull out. I think they will be out of business in Iraq. Um, and I think we could do the same in Afghanistan. We often think of terrorism as a problem that can only be solved through military means. And the truth is, much of what we see uh, um, among terrorist groups is motivated by politics. And if that means if we only try to use military means, we could easily make matters worse. What's the alternative to military means? Dialogue. Dialogue is crucial, and the Niagara Foundation's lecture series is one of the core means that we have to achieve that.